like the other quiz um, in this class, that is, uh, where it's three questions, short questions. Um, should not take you that long. But pretty much anything we've talked about this semester is fair game. All right? Um, so that's that. Second thing, um, we're winding down the blackjack cycle. Um, I want to get your input on if you like the way that we've done the last couple weeks or you would rather have the more straight traditional lecture format. Do we have a preference one way or another? <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. Does anyone have strong feelings either way um, against that? Does anyone not like that? Okay. Um, I will probably come up with another. Okay. Okay. Here's here's question two. Would you be more interested in a new si assignment or an extension of blackjack? Okay. That's kind of what I was leaning for anyhow, because what I have in mind kind of doesn't really lend itself to blackjack, but I thought I'd ask. Okay. All right. So I will consider that when I make the next assignment. Now, um, Thursday we will have our last full work day on blackjack. The, you know, if you certainly if you need to still work on it, you can work on it. I would suggest that you have other people look at your code to give you some input, whether it be me or, or a classmate or whatever, to do that. Before I begin, I'm never at a loss for something to say, or rarely at a loss for something to say. So if you don't have any questions, I do have material for a lecture. So don't feel obligated. But do you have any questions about blackjack now? Keeping in mind that we can address some of these questions after class during the, during the lab time. Questions about Blackjack. Right. Yes. Yeah, homework eight, you're supposed to actually playing against the dealer. Okay. Right. No, I don't think so. Homework nine. Homework nine is images and refactoring. Oh man, you you get shot for that in Vegas. Okay. Okay. Excellent. All right, and and we'll we'll go from there. What I want to talk about today is is your your next assignment. Uh, I'm going to go a little out of order in looking at Deedle's apps. So we're going to spend some time looking at a DDL app today, but then next week when I come up with a new assignment, we'll talk in terms of, of that assignment and, and taking inventory of what we know and what we don't know and, and so on, kind of like what we did with the Blackjack one, and then you'll have some time to design it. But the one we're going to do now is a simple contact list. I mean, this is probably an example in every single programming class ever, ever created. And there's a few things what I want to say, distinct about this. Um, first of all, it, inv it involves database um, interaction. All right, it involves data, data, database, I almost said Gatorade, I, I've lost my mind. Database uh, interaction with uh, a, a relational database. This is a more involved way of storing data than we did with the shared preferences. Shared preferences, we can store some quick and dirty pieces of data. That's all well and good. Um, but to really store some significant data, 
we, uh, what we need to store it in a relational database, just like we would in a regular application. Now, in a mobile platform, there's some distinct, how do I want to say, there's some distinct issues with that. All right. Let's spend a minute to talk about what the issues are. Uh, comparing a, say, a web application with a, with, a, with a mobile app, both of which access a database. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm speaking clearly uh, about that. But let's say we have a web site that does database interactivity. And let's say we have a mobile application that works with a local, by local I mean on the database, or on the, on the device database. What are some of the implications as far as that goes? All right. The biggest one is an issue of deployment. All right. And if you have, for example, you know, and we talked about this way at the beginning of, of the, the semester, whereas if you had something like this, where you have a clients accessing through the web a web server which is interacting with a database then the server is always returning back to the client HTML documents that is documents which include HTML JavaScript and um, CSS. So, in this scenario, if there's an update to the application or to the database, by update I mean we add a new column to a database, we add a new table, um, things along those lines. Only one place needs to know about that, and that is on the server. So if I update the application, I update it on the server. If I update the database, I update that on the server. The deployment issues are easy for web-based applications because the client is what is called sort of a thin client in, in, in some sense. That, in other words, they're viewing HTML pages via, via a browser. You don't need to have the client to actually do the connection to the database. All that stuff happens on the server. All right? Which there's a lot of nice aspects of that, you know. Amazon adds products every day probably. When do you as a client have the ability to access those? The next time you hit Amazon's site. Because there's really nothing stored on your machine. There's simply a web browser that makes requests to the web server and you get back an HTML page. So if they right now added a new product to their database and I, boom, went and queried it, I should get that results immediately. All right, the next time I queried. No updating or anything would have to be done. So really the big advantage that this guy has, that this model has, the web application, is deployment, bug fixing, that sort of thing. If you compare that to an application where the app and a local database live on a bunch of mobile devices and that's distributed via, say, the Google Play Store or something like that, if there's a bug in the app, that's going to live on each of the devices that it's installed in. All right? Which means what? To fix it for everyone, everyone would have to download the new copy all right, of the app. Now, prior to the days of mobiles, I worked, uh, I worked on a laptop-based application that was similar to this, where the application and data was sent, I guess you call it a distributed, distributed app, was sent to a laptop. All right, and it was frustrating for us 
that we would fix a problem, yet our field service engineers would still have the problem. Why? Well, because they hadn't downloaded and installed the latest update to it. So therefore, we would fix uh, the, the app and make it available on a certain day, send out diskettes or whatever we had it stored on at the time, but it was up to the field service engineer to go and, and update it. Now, I know now with apps, some of that is much more streamlined because some apps can automatically update themselves. But still, the intrinsic problem is that if we're talking about local database, and local application here, that it has to be corrected on all of these for it to truly be corrected and resolved. Now again, I want to sort of cover the range of apps, not just, you know, simple, gamey, sort of casual game entertaining ones, but also like mobile apps that a business could use too, because they would face that issue um, as well. Um, if there was a bug in the app, it would have to be downloaded again to be fixed. If there was a change to the database, that change would have to be reflected on all of these databases. All right. So... Let's look at the contact application from Deedle's book, the address book or whatever it's called, the content management system. And I want to focus on the stuff that's distinct to it. So let me go and run it. Try to put it on the dot cam. How's this for cutting edge design? It opens to a blank screen. And you have no idea what to do. Hey, I didn't write it. They did. All right. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to select the menu option, which again, because they have older code, the menu is down there. Actually, it should be up there. You can go and you can click to add contents. So I click to add contents and I get a screen with five text boxes there. If I go in and put in some information, and I click save, it becomes saved and appears in my address book uh, as part of the list. And I can hit the menu again and add another contact if I want to. If I click on this, it brings up a screen that shows the data for that content, for that contact rather. If I hit the menu and choose, I can choose to either edit or delete the contact. If I delete it, it will delete it, obviously. If I edit it, it takes me back to that and, uh, screen, and we can go and make whatever changes. And then finally, we can save it. All right? So there's really three screens here. And keep in mind that these three screens let's go in here. And let's go into edit mode. Notice as I click the back button here, I go back to the previous, back to the previous. This is actually one app that has three activities in it. It's a good approximation or simplification, let's say, to say that a screen that you get corresponds to an activity. Keeping in mind, we're not talking about like menu screens or those modal screens that pop up, but screens that pop up that allow the user to do something distinct is another activity. So this activity relates to seeing a list of customer or uh, contacts. This activity relates to viewing a contact. And then finally, this activity relates to entering contact information or editing it. 
So the first thing we'll see about this app is it, it has three different activities in it. All right. The other thing we'll see is this has persistent data in it. All right. I'm not going to go in in the interest of time, but I could go in and add multiple contacts. All right. Uh, I can, it, it, and, and again, if I were to shut this down and bring it back up, it's stored in a database, and so those contacts would still be there, even if I powered down and brought it back up. All right? So that is what is distinct about this application. Let's take a look at the code and see how some of this is done. First of all, the Android manifest is a little different for this one because we actually have three activities. And again, they're the three activities that I mentioned. There's the initial activity, which is sort of the main activity. When we launch this, that's the one that's going to get launched, which is a listing of all of our contacts. We then have two other activities, an add edit contact activity and a view contact activity. And if we look, we actually have four Java classes. We have one Java class for each activity and then we have our database helper class that we're going to look at. Notice that each one of these, other than the database connector, the database pipeline, is itself an activity. The first one, address book, is a little bit different kind of activity than what we've seen so far. It is a list activity. Which, if you sort of think about it, it makes sense, right? This first page is an activity which shows a list of contacts. So if I had a second, third, fourth, I'm going to have a list of contacts. So it's an activity where the chief interface is a list. I then have a view contact, which is a plain old activity, and an edit contact, which is also a plain old activity. I then have this database connector class, which we'll come to in a few minutes. Let's look at the resources. Again, notice we have our resource qualifiers with the launch icon for the different screen densities. We have uh, menus created here, the XML for menus. And we have layout. We have three XMLs for layout, each of them corresponding to each of the activities. Now, if we look at the main activity, The XML for the main activity is actually just a single item. We'll see how this list view gets populated, this list activity gets populated in a different way. We don't specify all the rows that could exist in the list view. We have a list activity and we populate that list. The XML file simply shows how one row in that list is going to look. So if it's a list activity, we don't define in the XML the list. We define one item in that list. And what are we storing for that one item for that list? Well, we're storing simply a text view. All right. If we look back over here on our list, what am I storing? Simply a text view for that person's name. The other two XML files are going to look 
a little more familiar. For ad contact, we have a scroll view, just in case we're on a very small screen and it's not able to fit all the stuff in at once. But we have a scroll view that contains a linear layout. And again, linear layouts can either be oriented horizontally or vertically. Ours is oriented vertically. And we have simply a bunch of edit text fields. And finally, a button. So that is pretty, pretty similar to what we've seen previously. Our view contact is very similar except it uses a table view because when we're entering data in, when we're viewing it, it shows the label and then the value. When we're editing, it shows just the text box and there really is no label associated with it. Instead, there's a little hint that says what we should put in there. So for example, for address, it says street, then city, state, and zip. That is, sort of, that, that is the text boxes or the edit text hint. All right. So what's really different here is the fact that this, the contact list XML consists of really just a single text view. And we don't see a list of it because we don't need to because the activity itself is a list activity. All right, we have our strings and styles. Just as we've done before, I don't think there's anything earth shattering here, either in the strings or the styles. Nothing that we have not seen before, I don't believe. The manifest we saw, the big difference being that um, there is a, um, there, there are multiple activities defined within it. So let's take a look at this. One thing is a warning, um, there is some of this code is deprecated um, because this is an older example. So you'll notice a couple warnings in here saying that a particular thing that they've done is, is deprecated. All right. So. When we open up this application, we execute the on create. All right. We call the super classes on create. We grab the list view. All right. This is something a little different than we've done before. Typically, with most activities we've used so far, we've used generic activities. And generic activities, we define the view in an XML file. This, however, is a list activity, which means that by default, it gets a built-in or it has a built-in list view. So we don't have to make the XML. This is where I was getting before, where I said that the XML associated with this activity is not a list because that list is built in to the list activity. But we still have to grab a pointer to it so that we can access things. So on the list activity, we say contact list activity equals get list view. So that grabs a pointer to the list that's associated with this list activity. We set the on click listener for the whole view to be view contact listener. All right. 
How can we do that? How can we have one on click listener for the entire list? How is it going to know which contact we want to see? Right, but I've set, I've set only one on click listener for the whole list. So how, let, you know, if I were to add a second contact here, Okay, I think so. Let's enter Carl in. So now I got Hank and Carl. I click on Hank, I get Hank. I click on Carl, I get Carl. So there's one on click listener, and yet it's bringing up the different people. How does that do it? And you're getting, you're getting warm. We did have the same thing with the, with the flag quiz. How did the flag game know which guy we clicked on, which button we clicked on, or flag? I, I, I've forgotten that one already, exactly how the, the UI worked for it. Yeah, it did do that at some point. Exactly. The view, the, view that was clicked. the view that actually got clicked. So if we go and look at this on click listener, which is view contact listener, which I need new glasses, so bear with me. Yeah, that's it right there. I told you I needed new glasses. These are actually old glasses. These are probably two glasses old. I broke my current glasses in the fatal fall of, of September, not September, March 15th. And then I think I rolled over when I was sleeping and broke my second spare pair of glasses sometime after that. So these are non-bifocal glasses. So that's why you notice sometimes I look like an old time librarian by pushing down the glasses like that so I can see. Um, this also may warn you to avoid me if you see me on the road. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I really do need to get a new pair of glasses. Something like that. At any rate, we're absolutely correct that, notice that, this actually is an item click listener, which is a little different than a click listener. It's meant to be a click listener for a list. And sure enough, we get past a list of arguments. And those arguments are what we use to figure out what row got clicked, what text button got clicked. All right. We'll come back to this at a later point, but I did want to make the point um, that that is how that is how multiple um, how one control with uh, one view with multiple views on it can actually do different things depending on what view is clicked because the argument knows which guy got clicked. Yep. 
you could read the text off the button. You could. You certainly could. Um, yeah, that that would that would be another way to work that. All right. We then we want to specify how to populate the list. All right. So we have to specify, first of all, what we want in our list and where we want to put it in the list. All right. So this view, this list view, is a list of items. Each one of those items contains a text box. Each one of those text boxes has an ID of, looking at the XML file, contact text view. So essentially what we're saying here is we want to put from our adapter the name into that text box that has the value of contact text view. So in other words, we're going to retrieve some data. We're going to take the, the piece of data called name and we're going to put it in that view called contact text view. The contact adapter, what we're doing is we're sort of creating a pipeline between our list and the data. We're saying that the XML that we want to use for each row in the list comes from contact list item. And then we are saying that we want to take stuff from data, from the data field called name, and we want to put it in the field called contact text view. Now our list, this particular list only contains one item. So we have one text box and we have one piece of data that's filling that text box. But if we had multiple text boxes, let's say we put the first name and the last name or the name and the email address, then we could populate this array with um, with uh, a list of the fields that we wanted and we would populate the two array with a list of the fields or the views that we want to put these things in.
We then set the list adapter to the contact adapter which we created here. Let's look at what the set list adapter method does. The set list adapter effectively does like you do in ASP.NET when you do a data binding. The adapter is like the data source. Right. And we're going and we're binding that. The thing I am missing is where we're actually retrieving the data. That's what I am puzzled with right at this moment. I'm not seeing that code. Oh, I, it's down here. So in the onCreate, we just sort of set things up and create the data binding. We haven't retrieved the data yet. The onResume is where the actual retrieval goes. I was kind of surprised to see it down there. I thought that would also be on the onCreate. But apparently, we want to do it when we resume as well. And we create a new get contacts task, and we execute it. And we are getting back. Uh, or we're passing a empty array of objects. Yeah. Yes. I could put suppress warnings on that. Be like the data source, like the SQL data source. Yeah. All right, so here's where we're actually retrieving the data. All we sort of have done so far is we've wired our list view to that adapter. Now we're going in and we're populating the adapter. We're actually retrieving the data. And we do this using our database connector object. That database connector is going to help us out with a lot of stuff. All right. Now, one thing about database interactivity is that in CPU terms, it takes a long time to go and query a database and bring stuff back. If, for example, we had a very large database and we executed a query, if we were waiting for the query to end, we wouldn't be able to process things such as touching the screen and doing things like that. Any of you that have used Android uh, applications, have you seen the message something to the effect of application not responding or something along those lines? I forget the exact verbiage. Um, what that means is that there's some processing going on that's keeping the device busy and it can't even respond to your clicks. Well, that's bad news in an application when it can't respond to the UI events. So a lot of these things we are going to run as asynchronous tasks. 
We run them as asynchronous tasks because this will allow the device to switch between monitoring the GUI and doing the database access. All right? So we will do these sort of threading, perform the database query outside the GUI thread. We do this threading so that the Java virtual machine can spend a little bit of time doing database access, a little bit of time keeping eye on the GUI to see if we've touched anything. All right? If we didn't do that, we're liable to be trying to back out of the application and it would not be able to process um, our request. So that's why this is created as an asynchronous task. All right, do in background. We have in our data connector an open method, and we call that. And finally, we call a method to get all the contacts on our data connector. We also have on post execute. Remember, the idea of an asynchronous process is that we don't know necessarily how long it's going to take, and we're not going to wait around for it to finish. We're going to send it out there, but we may likely have something that we want to do when we're done. And in this case, when that is done, after this executes, we go and we set our contact adapter's cursor to the results. In other words, we populate the list associated with the connection adapter with the list of data that the database has retrieved. All right. Let's look at the database connector object because there's at least two methods that we want to look at. We want to look at the database connector um, method for open and get all contacts. Open simply uses this database open helper object to grab a pointer to the database. Now, if the database already exists, Fine, it opens it. We're given a name of a database here that we are creating. The database name we're creating is called user contacts. So if that database exists, this open command is going to open it. If the database doesn't exist, it is going to create it. And this database open helper object down here has as one of its methods this class extends the SQLite open helper. There is an onCreate method that gets called. All right? So, the very first time that you run this application on a device, there is no contact database out there. So the code is going to try to run it and open it. All right, it's not going to find that contact database out there. But what it's going to do is it's going to call the onCreate method on the database open helper. And what does that do? That executes a SQL statement that creates the table that we need in that database. So this is how we get the database and the database structure onto the client devices. In this case, we only have a single table, right? But if we had multiple tables, we would have multiple create statements to create all the tables. We could also have create statements to create foreign key relationships and so on. This essentially is creating a database using data definition language, which is 
an alternative to the way that you typically do it in a development environment where you go through a GUI to create the database. Right? Typically, if you're writing a desktop application, you go in and you create the database and you manipulate it through the, the DBMS and, and you define it that way. This create statement allows us to deploy this on a bunch of different machines, right? So I create the database on my development machine, so what? We have to get that database to each of the clients, each of the devices on which this is going to be installed. What's the mechanism for doing that? Well, we try to open the database. If it can't open the database, it creates it, and then it calls the onCreate method to create the tables and any other stuff that we need. And again, if you look, this is a SQL statement. It's not a typical SQL statement that we use, but it's a create, to create the, the table called contacts. Uh, when you, does it create it when you don't have one? Exactly. If you don't have one, it creates it and calls the onCreate method. Okay. Right. Now, let's go back to, and we're not going to explore this to great detail, but I think it's important to understand this at least on a conceptual level. Going back to this diagram. Remember we said that the problem with this scenario is we release app version 1.0 with a database in a certain structure. We update the database to add a table or to add a column or whatever. And now we have version 1.1 with a slightly changed database. How does the change to the database get sent to the new the, the, the new updates, the updates of someone that had an existing code. That change gets sent via this method, on upgrade. In other words, you can version those databases, and you can look at the current version of the database and the new version of the database, and you can go in and you can write code that says if you're going from database version, well, as I say 1.1, but it's an integer. If you're going from database version 1 to 2, then you need to add table B. If you're going from 1 to 3, you need to add table B and table C, or something along those lines. So this is a mechanism that you can have built right within your application to update the database structure, to handle those deployment issues. It seems. Yeah, if, yeah, the way you described it, yeah, exactly. You would, you would have to do something along those lines. Right. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, n requiring iOS 7 would be just because the, you know, they've developed something using capabilities that aren't available in earlier ones. But the auto update, uh, that's a good question. Probably because they want to force you to listen to U2, so they force you to download uh, albums like that. I, I don't know.
What are your other options? What, yeah, what are the other options for having? Okay, you, and, and what's the problems with that? Right, and it depends, it depends what we're talking about having in the database, right? Um, I had a student in the advanced Android class write an app where it was a database, but it was like not a database that the customer could manipulate. It might be, for example, a listing of their products, the company's products, in which case, who is accessing the database if it was out on, the web, on a web server that wouldn't matter, you know, you're all accessing the same database, so you're not really, like, updating, so that would be less of an is issue. But yeah, I mean, that's the exact problem of this, you know, is... That would, that would be another option. You could, you could... Um, have something that would go and, um, you know, export the data from one, import it to the other. But you don't want, like, people losing data. Like, you went from version 1 to 2, there was a new column added, so all your contacts are gone. Because it said, hey, I don't know about this, I'm going to delete the database and start over. You know, you don't want something like that. So, you'd want to have some way of, of accommodating it. But the, but the thing is, and I guess the thing... The, the, the thing that I want to emphasize, you know, and, and mention that some of this, in a way, is sort of beyond the scope of this class to, to delve into it too deep, deeply, but to say, here's your hook. Here is where that, here is a mechanism that does that. The mechanism to create the database is here. The mechanism to update the database is here. And we hope that we're not, you know, ideally we're not updating the database and totally changing the structure. Can I ask what, what you were doing? It made a lot of noise, yeah. Okay. Oh, I mean, I, I don't care. It was just... You and you on the roads and all that. I don't know what you did. Right, right, right. I have, I have a student in one of my class that... And again, maybe it's the way the sound funnels up here. Because I do know, like, when people walk through the hall, it's like, I can't even think, you know. But I have a student in my one class that must use a jackhammer on his keyboard when he's typing. Because all you can hear is as I'm trying to lecture. So yeah, that, that's okay. I'm sorry for being nosy. I was just curious he's what like was... Easily distracted today, though. Like, Maybe I am easily... Yeah, it's going to be that time of the semester. <laughs> I, I have a theory. I, when I was an undergrad, I went under the quarter system. And... The quarter system was what, like 11 or 12 weeks? So, so my mind starts to get squirrely around the time that, that a quarter would end, I think. So we're like in week nine now, so we would be just a few more weeks if we were in quarters. So, uh, no, no, one has, no one has answered what that is, by the way. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and I remember... I remember, I rem now that I see the bottle, I remember, because I, when the first time I saw her with that, I'm like, is she drinking Jack Daniels? You know? It's, <laughs> okay, at any rate, onward and upward. 
this is a mechanism by which we can create and we can update the database. Now, we also had in here, if you remember, we were calling on this guy. Database connector, get all contacts. Again, to review the purpose of this middle, middle layer, why doesn't this guy simply call the database connector method? Because we want it to be threaded. And we'll, we'll spend more time talking about threading, but essentially the idea is we don't want it getting bogged down in uh, doing database interactivity and losing control of being able to click on it and all that. We, we want to we wanna share the time between that. So we call get all contacts on that and get all contacts if we look actually it's a nice thing we simply return we simply have a list of things that we are returning database query contacts that's the table that we want new string this is what we're returning this is a list of column names that we're returning we're returning the ID and name null 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 name what do you think those guys are no fair looking yes good guess Yes, it's, it's exactly like that. Okay. So your, your query there is, you know, select, like, you're returning ID and name. So yes. Select, would be select ID and name from contacts. Mm -hmm. um, one of the nulls is probably a where clause. Um, I'm going to guess that last one is just where clause. Exactly. These are the different clauses. In other words, if we look at this, Selection and selection arguments, that would be pieces of the where clause. Group by, if there's a group by clause, would be the next one. Having would be this one. Can't have the having without the group by, right? Uh, having is like a where clause for groups, all right? And then finally, the last one's the order by. So essentially, this is writing a SQL statement for you in a way. All right? And this is going to return then a cursor, which a cursor is like a list, all right, of items. Yeah. And it is again, that gets put in the when it gets returned, we're returning or rather the cursor that this guy returns, we are setting that cursor to our adapter. In other words, we're updating our adapter with the new list of contract, uh, contacts that we retrieve from the database. And then we close our connection <coughs> object. That effectively, because we now have set the list of stuff associated with that adapter, we've specified how to map from the adapter to the GUI, right? The name from the cursor gets put into that view in the GUI. We've set that up. We then set the adapter for the list. We set the cursor for the adapter and magically we have our list of contacts. All right. A little confusing, I know, but we will go over this and we'll focus especially on the aspects of this when I form whatever the next assignment is. We'll look at the pieces of this that are most important. Uh, 
I'm a little rusty on the Apple Core data, but it sure didn't seem to me substantially easier than this. Yeah, I, I, it seems like it did a lot of the same stuff, but maybe just worded a little differently or whatever. I, 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 I must confess, though, that, that I, can't, I can't recall that. Could, could very well be. That would take in objects that you knew how to replicate back. So that way then you're not having a lot of say so that you may need to. Could very well be. Uh, again, this, the, the purpose of this is to, d to demonstrate um, certain concepts and certain classes and objects and their uses. So yeah, I, I can definitely agree with, with that assessment that you could probably write more efficient code to reduce duplication as opposed to the example. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. Uh, I'm trying to think. I, I, I swear I remember looking for a viewer that would view a SQLite database on an Android, unless I'm terribly confused and thinking of something else. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet on that, but I swear, I, or or like for like a, a, a like almost like a Firefox plugin, if I remember right. Almost sure. Uh, I remember, if I remember right, it was it was again the same fellow that was doing the advanced Android project. He had some questions, and I think we were using that tool to kind of troubleshoot it. But ah, uh, you're right. I'm easily distracted today. I don't. I don't. And, and bad memory to boot. So. I don't remember that exactly. All right. Thursday will be a work day to work in, in uh, the last official work day to work on the blackjack stuff. Uh, next week, we will look more at some of this database stuff, and I'll have the assignment for the next quasi work together app. All right. You're going to be, you're going to be sick next Thursday. Right? Next Thursday? Why am I? Why are we going to be sick that day? I, I can't be. Uh, yeah, because uh, apparently high school football is more important than, than trick or treating. Uh, they're pushing trick or treating. Oh, okay. Okay. Ours must be Sunday after. Ours is always Sunday afternoon. Amherst. Yeah. Yeah. Amherst and Lorraine. This in Lorraine County area are like two of the weird ones that do it like during the day and the afternoon. Yeah, I know. I know. Like from my, div I, it may even be different because I'm Amherst Township instead of Amherst Metropolis. So uh, we don't have sidewalks. So that's why, that was the rationale I always heard why they did it during the day. Kids got to walk in the street, you know, and then they... <laughs> yeah, I know, and it was uphill both ways. In the snow. Yeah, in the snow. Well, I, I, I saw someone post on Facebook. Do you guys remember those push merry-go-rounds that you'd have, like, on playgrounds? Like they, oh, really? And I swear, the ground underneath it was concrete on my part. 
And it's like, how did people even survive? How are there any of us in the, you know, in in this age block? How come we weren't all killed in playground accidents? I don't, I don't know. I, uh, there was always like some wise guy that would get it like way faster than I was comfortable with. And it's like, I always hated him. I, I, I wasn't a particularly bold child, as you might imagine. All right. Uh, that's it for class. Uh, if you have questions over blackjack, we can address them now. I have one other question, just real quick. I yeah. Yes. I don't know. Are you, are you eligible to register through the early registration for class? Yeah, register for the class this year, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it wouldn't let me register for assistance development. I tried to talk to us and talk instead of just the like this requisite and the system just can't handle it. For, for the system class, I could see. Yeah, but for your class, it said, uh, for the advanced answer, it said that uh, it said that you need to renew Oh. You know what? All right. I'll, I'll make a note of that. Um, what that is, I think, 